So the 3000 series launch of Ryzen has been phenomenal and the latest generation of Threadripper is dominating the high-end desktop market. But how good are these things at overclocking and what's the right way to go about doing it? Let's get into it. So the 3960X24 Core 48 Thread Behemoth on the Zenith 2 Extreme. How do you go about overclocking it. The system setup includes 64 gigs of G-Skill memory at 3600 MHz, and we've got the latest BIOS version from Asus, that's 0702 at the time of making this video. Overclocking is a process of kind of adjusting the voltages and the frequency to get an overclock that's stable. To test that stability, we're using ADA64, absolutely fantastic benchmark program and we're also using a Ryzen Master to check the CPU temperatures. Most of the applications that I used were telling me something different about the temperature of the CPU. Following a little bit of research it looks like Ryzen Master is the best view of kind of an average between the cores. I have to say that the stability of that program absolutely sucks. We had to reinstall it several times. We had to delete a couple of key entries or one key entry to be specific um, and keep rebooting the system in order to get the program to work. I do think that that was probably Probably slightly indicative of system stability as well but I think it was unstable the program was unstable at stable overclocks despite uh, the instability introduced through the overclocks that's a bit of a ramble it doesn't make a lot of sense it's a flaky program so overclocking the memory was a breeze for complete transparency this G skill kit is not on the qualified vendor list qualified vendor list lists out all of the memory that have been tested on this board it doesn't mean if yours is not on there it won't work it just means it's not been tested by the manufacturer the 32 gig variant of this memory was on there so i'm not surprised the 64 gig version worked okay that went straight to 3600 megahertz using the DOCP uh, profile available within the main board so that just automatically sets the right voltages the right speed and does all of the latency timings I would recommend while you're doing these overclocks that you reboot the system and do a very brief stability test with each change if you change too many things in one go you're never going to know uh, if the system's unstable what it is that's caused that problem the BIOS interface in the Zenith 2 Extreme is a breeze to use. It's really, really simple, and overclocking the CPU only required us to change two things. That was the frequency, or the multiplier, on the CPU and the voltage that we were applying to it. All other settings were left the same, and the BIOS stability is orders of magnitude better and more stable than previous generations of this platform. So started tinkering about with the frequency um, initially putting it up to 4.3 gigahertz that was at a voltage uh, of 1.36875 volts it's worth using the plus or minus arrows as you're adjusting these things it's there are only certain voltages that you can apply. It's not like you can set every variable in there specifically. So using the plus and minus just to edge those things up. And we started increasing the frequency at that voltage until we got instability. And then subsequently increase the voltage until you're stable again. Then tweak the frequency back up again until unstable and you get the general sense of the sort of cycle that you get we got the system rock solid stable at uh, 4.35 gigahertz that was at a fairly hefty voltage of 1.38125 and running stability checks of this in ADA 64 monitoring those temperatures in Ryzen Master it was a little toastier than I was comfortable with that Ryzen, Mice, that Ryzen Master software quite clearly calls out that you don't want to go above 95 uh, degree C um, and it was reporting average temperatures of 100 101 I think I saw at one point now I should be clear there was no thermal throttling at all and 
interesting that the Zenith 2 um, Extreme LCD screen was reporting something completely different, like almost 10 degrees cooler than we were actually seeing in the software. But despite that, I wasn't comfortable with that. So we cranked it back down to uh, 4.3 gigahertz at a much cooler, uh, back to that 1.36875. Now, that was consistently staying below 90 degrees C, which was nice to see. Um, now, it's not a workload that you're really ever going to put through your system. Um, <laughs> maxing out 24 cores, 48 threads, 100%. Um, I couldn't even do that probably with three or four instances of Premiere Pro running if I was able to do that. The system is never going to run at this kind of capacity, but it's nice to know that if it did, that your cooling solution is going to keep it uh, cooler than the recommended thermals for the CPU. Now, for complete clarity, I'm using a 480mm radiator with a custom and dedicated water cooling loop. There are no other components on here. We've got a separate loop for the two uh, 2080 Ti's that we've got in the system. And there's some pretty exotic cooling. You probably could achieve something similar with a uh, an AIO, but this entire video comes with my caveat of um, your silicon is going to be slightly different in terms of performance than I've got. Your cooling solution is going to be slightly different. So don't just go and bang in the numbers that I've put in. Do go through that cycle of creeping up your frequency until you're unstable, then put your voltage up until you are, then frequency up, voltage up, frequency, voltage up. Now, I went up to 1.4 volts in the endeavor to try and get 4.4 gigahertz. Wow, it really was getting very, very, very toasty at that point. We were seeing reported temperatures of 105, 106 degrees. Again, no thermal throttling here, but I, really uncomfortable. I do think if we kept going, we probably would have got stable at 4.4 gigahertz. But frankly, guys, the amounts of gains that you're making at this point relative to the shortening of the life of your CPU, the thermals, and more importantly, the power that you're drawing from the wall and therefore your electricity bill aren't worth banging in. So we settled. We settled at 4.3 gigahertz. There's some charts in front of you that show what we were getting in terms of Cinebench R15, R20 scores, relatively negligible actually between 4.3 and 4.35. Um, it's worth noting that the single threaded scores at stock um, were a little bit better. That's not surprising given that this claims to have a boost clock at 4.5 uh, gigahertz for very bursty, what it describes as very bursty, short-lived threads. I don't know what that means. In reality, we never saw this go above 4.4 gigahertz. So if you're teetering around an overclock at 4.3 gigahertz, 4.35 gigahertz, um, you're going to be getting some stonking multi-threaded performance uh, relative to the base clock of 3.8 gigahertz. You know, that's a 500 or 550 megahertz overclock very respectable um, and you're seeing negligible performance degradation in your single threaded workload so i think it's recommended so i think the recommended sweet spot is for this cooling solution 4.3 gigahertz there's plenty of other people reporting similar results online um, let me know how you get on with your overclock down in the comments below. If you've got any questions, throw them out there. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, and uh, that's really the conclusion of the video. So, as always, I hope you're really well wherever in the world you are. Please like, share and subscribe. And I'll see you in my next one.